When last heard from, Congress had before it 59 separate bills designed to provide 59 varieties of protection for newsmen. These have come to be called shield bills, and they are being hotly debated. The committee of Congress that has especially addressed itself to the problem uh, is headed by Senator Irvin, the same Irvin who is implicated in Watergate. Uh, Senator Irvin has said that in all his life he has not had so hard a time formulating just the right bill. To discuss the question, we have here two men who are both lawyers and uh, writers. Uh, Mr. C. Dickerman Williams, who for many months, a few years ago, was the moderator of this program, is a graduate of Yale and of the Yale Law School. He was clerk to the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, William Howard Taft, uh, has served as general counsel to the Department of Commerce, as a member of the National Board of the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, as counselor to the Committee for Cultural Freedom, and has practiced in New York City all of his life, collecting the most brilliant clients in the city, <laughs> and has written for scholarly journals and journals of opinion on many legal subjects. <coughs> Mr. Charles Rembar is a graduate of Harvard and of the Columbia Law School, who also practiced in New York City, also practices in New York City. He is the <coughs> author of The End of Obscenity, which won the George Polk Memorial Award for the outstanding book published in 1968. Uh, he was editor of the Columbia Law Review, has written for a number of quarterlies, monthlies, and newspapers, uh, and in fact wrote on the subject of the Shield Laws in a recent issue of the Atlantic uh, Monthly. I should like to begin by asking Mr. Rembar if he has handy a formulation by which one can uh, define who is a newsman. I don't have one handy, but I'll make one for you. Uh, a newsman, I would say, is anyone who is professionally engaged <clears throat> in transmitting news to the public. You mean that he does it for a living? Or all the time. So that would exclude what, uh, say, student, uh, student uh, reporters? Uh, I think you've just given me an amendment. Uh -huh. would, it, would it exclude you uh, if, uh, if it happened that you undertook to report on, on something and write about it for the New York Times, Sunday Magazine, say, for which you have written? Well, you see, I'm, uh, I'm doubly protected. Uh, when I'm not writing, I'm being a lawyer. And as you know, there's an attorney-client privilege. Now, if I just yeah. went to medical school, and also became a priest, I suppose there's nothing they could get out of me. But, but pr presumably, presumably the criminals that you would be shielding would not necessarily be your clients. If I were writing on that subject, if, uh, say, I owed another article to Atlantic and got information in the course of preparing that article, I would say then I would be professionally a newsman. Well, then you're really saying that uh, uh, if during the period that you were writing the article, you were writing the article, uh, you become a newsman, AO Ipso, it doesn't have to be, therefore, a professional transaction. So suppose it was a, 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 an academic quarterly, they pay nothing, and therefore there isn't uh, uh, a professional compensation. Would uh, you say that you ought to be protected even then? I don't think professionalism depends entirely on getting money for what you do. No, I don't either, but. Uh, I'm not, I'm not talking about the quality of your work. I'm, I'm, trying to, uh, I'm trying to understand your definition. Well, I was, when I said... Well, who, I'll put it this way, who would not be covered? What would be an example of somebody who would not be covered as a newsman? Well, suppose one of these people sitting here uh, with us uh, had someone come up to him and say, here, I've got some hot dope for you, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, gave him or her the information. <clears throat> And this particular person is not on the college newspaper or preparing an article for any publication or working on a book that relates to this information. Then uh, that person in that situation would not be a newsman. What about a stringer? Define a stringer for me. Well, a stringer is somebody who uh, looks for targets of opportunity. Uh, if, uh, if a New Haven stringer for the New York Times sees something going on that he thinks would interest the New York Times, he calls them up. And if they say, yes, we'll use it, then they pay for it but he is otherwise a, a medical student or a, a doctor or, or anything. Would he be, is he a newsman? Well, I, I would think when he's doing that, he's a newsman. When he's studying his medical texts, he's not. 
well, depends on what you're doing uh, at the given <clears throat> moment. Mm -hmm. do, 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 do you find, uh, Mr. Williams, that the difficulty that Senator Irvin and others confess that they have in defining a newsman uh, itself shows a sort of a, a sort of a, a ontological difficulty in trying to phrase a law for the protection of quotes newsmen. Well, I, I think it certainly shows one of the difficulties, one of the one of the reasons against a broad, all-inclusive shield law, certainly, because uh, such a law might. Uh, might be deemed to cover almost anybody who could be said, uh, uh, who could profess to say that he was intending to write a pamphlet, let us say, or contribute to some underground publication or whatever. Almost anybody, uh, you, uh, a definition could be so broad as to include almost anybody who, who sought information or who received information and who had the slenderest claim to, to being a journalist. I mean, after all, as the Supreme Court has uh, repeatedly <clears throat> said uh, years ago political activity or political journalism was largely conducted by means of pamphlets. Tom Paine, for instance, was a pamphleteer. Would an incipient uh, Tom Paine, somebody who aspired to be a Tom Paine, would he be come under a shield law? I mean, that is the problem. Well, there, there being no, uh, no, professional, no professional organization that uh, admits one to membership, as there is uh, uh, among you, you lawyers, you, you do therefore have that, that difficulty. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you this, uh, Mr. Rambaugh, to what extent do you think that the difficulty in deciding that question is holding up, uh, the, uh, uh, is holding up the formulation uh, of a bill that might prove acceptable to Congress? I think that's uh, one of the lesser difficulties. What is one of the greater ones? Uh, distinguishing among uh, the places and occasions where the newsman might be called upon to give this kind of testimony. <coughs> uh, for example, the grand jury, uh, a trial, an open trial, and uh, in connection with open trials, on the one hand a criminal trial, on the other a civil trial, uh, the legislative uh, investigating committee, and that committee, uh, on the one hand, in closed session, and on the other, in open session. Uh, I think those problems are more difficult. The kind of thing well, we, we've well, been that is, talking that is, about. That isn't it. a problem, surely, for people who think there ought to be an absolute protection, is it? Uh, well, I'm not certain what an absolute protection is. Well, it, it's uh, what, say, Frank Stanton is for. Does he say that applies to all these uh, forms that I've mentioned? You mean on the on the question of whether somebody's properly a newspaper man? No, or you mean the civil and so, oh yeah, yes, mm -hmm. everywhere. Yes, yes, he does. Uh -huh. uh, now he he confessed to a metamorphosis in his opinions uh, back in October. He he thought that they should have a qualified one, but uh, post October, he began to feel that um, that the minute that you begin to qualify, uh, you uh, <coughs> you open up loopholes which themselves uh, uh, you know can become sort of super highways through which. Uh, Sh uh, shrewd lawyers can talk their their clients, and in fact, there seems to be a consolidated opinion among backers of laws of this kind. Give us an absolute protection, or forget it, and we'll take our chances with the courts. Now, so my question, therefore, is: uh, Is it your opinion that uh, that the absolutists have, have 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 lost their case? That there's no point really in discussing it. There may be some point in discussing it. The nice thing about being an absolutist is that you can stop thinking. Uh, it makes things very easy, or seems to, but it doesn't really, because once you draft the legislation, no matter what it says, <coughs> questions of interpretation will arise. And even if you put it in the most absolute terms, you might still come up with a constitutional question yeah. where somebody will say that some other provision of the Bill Prevails. of Rights must prevail over this piece of legislation. So that uh, there is just no magic, automatic, dandy set of propositions that will work for all cases without any struggle. Well, Mr. Williams, in, in the, uh, as I understand it, the, the decisions given by the Supreme Court in June of 1972, uh, the thrust of them was that a newspaper man is not a privileged, i.e., that he, right. he can be asked the same questions other people can be asked. Right. Now, uh, 
among the dissenters there, since it was four to four with one sort of narrow concurrence, was, was there anybody who was taking sort of a Hugo Black position, the, the so-called absolutist Doug position? Douglas did. Justice Douglas, Douglas took the absolutist position. Yeah. Now, Justice... Do you, uh, do, you, do you think of him as sort of an in, in intellectual Coventry, or do you think that uh, his is the, 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 the uh, uh, view of the future concerning newspaper men's privileges? Well, I'm a little careful about uh, describing the future these days. Uh, I think uh, Douglas is, is a... Uh, some things that Douglas favored years ago have come to pass. Other things haven't. Uh, I don't... I did not think that his, his opinion was very persuasive, not persuasive to me at, at any rate. And I would, I would regret to see that it, it adopted. I hope it isn't the wave of the future. Well, <clears throat> should, should we then proceed to... Um, do you think we can proceed, uh, perhaps until we turn to the panel, uh, in simply disregarding the absolutist uh, solution uh, as, um, as irrelevant and talk about the mutations? Well, Does I, that I, make sense? I would suggest uh, something for discussion that might come so close to an absolutist position that, uh, that you would want to... Uh, that you would feel it, it needs some comment. Uh, I think where appearances before the grand jury are concerned, <coughs> uh, that newsmen ought to be awfully close uh, to an absolute immunity. I think things are different before the grand jury than they are in any kind of open hearing, because uh, the main point of these shield statutes is that in order to get information to the public, newsmen should have access to sources and that sources will be frightened away if they think uh, inf information that they give confidentially can be uh, wormed out by court process. Now, these sources have no way of knowing what goes on inside uh, the grand jury room. And so... <laughs> ha, ha, ha. <coughs> they can't be sure. They can't be sure. I mean, they don't read Jack Anderson? They, they don't read the New York Times. <laughs> uh, we're talking about the sources. Uh, the... The, the, really, he can never know just what the reporter did. The reporter can go in and come out and say, I protected you right <coughs> down the line, but the source doesn't know that. Yeah. While if it's a trial in open court, the source knows exactly what happens. Mm -hmm. In addition, I think the need for the information is less pressing in grand jury proceedings than it is in some of the other situations I've mentioned. Uh, a grand jury my mind an overrated institution anyway. Very good institution in 1166, but uh, of declining importance since then, uh, has all sorts of ways of getting information. As you know, they can rely on hearsay. Uh, if their indictment turns out to be wrong, that can be corrected in court. So that in that particular uh, situation, while <coughs> I can think of some possible exceptions, I would keep the exception so narrowly limited as to say that for all practical purposes, a uh, newspaper man had something very like an absolute immunity in grand jury proceedings. That is, I would favor it. How would you analyze that, Mr. Williams? Uh, well, I, I would disagree. Uh, Mr. Buckley, you didn't mention in describing my career that at one time I was an assistant U.S. attorney. And in that capacity, I conducted a number of investigations before uh, the grand jury. And of course, to some extent, the district attorney is the guide of the grand jury, and uh, information and testimony seems terribly hard to get when you're conducting one of these investigations, and really the only way the prosecution has of getting the testimony, the evidence of a, of a reluctant witness, is by calling him before the grand jury. Uh, and often the reluctant witness has the best, in, has, the, has uh, completely essential evidence without which the prosecution could not succeed. That is the reason, of course, for the various immunity statutes, <coughs> by the reason of which a witness gets immunity if he is called before the grand jury uh, when he doesn't want to testify. Uh, the, the investigation of unsolved crimes where, uh, is a very tedious one, and often the evidence of a newspaper man can be most helpful, and in a way which would not in any way, uh, as far as I can make out, interfere with the career of the newspaper man or with jeopardizing of his sources. I might say I, I find that this, uh, all this anxiety about uh, sources uh, 
uh, particularly unpersuasive in the light of what's happened since June 1972. Uh, it doesn't seem to me that my entire life have I read so much information, uh, so much news published by the New York Times, which is a newspaper I ordinarily read, based upon sources as I have seen since June 1972, which seems to be source, source, source. Well, the distinction is presumably that the sources gave the New York Times that information with the permission to use it, but not with permission to divulge the name of the source. Well, I think sources always give it the information to the newspaper man with permission to use it. Otherwise, they wouldn't give it to him at all. Not necessarily. They might give it to them uh, contingently. And they might say, uh, use this if such and such happens. Well, uh, if I understood Justice Stewart's opinion correctly, uh, he was concerned about the rule adopted by the majority and that it would obstruct the flow of information from sources to newspaper men. All I can say is that it seems to me that events since June 1972 have demonstrated that uh, those fears are largely imaginary, well, or largely could it, could unrealistic. It, could it be that since that that's because since June of 1972, uh, uh, ten different courts have seemed to go on the side of the source post uh, post Caldwell uh, in such a way as to reassure the sources. Also, could it not be that the fact that a, a few reporters went to jail? Uh, a fact which was well publicized, uh, may have encouraged sources. I should have thought discouraged. I think it would no, discourage them. No, uh, I think it may have encouraged them by showing that the press was ready to go down the line oh. to preserve confidentiality. You, you, you mean on the grounds that, uh, that the hero William Farr was totally typical of his profession? Well, on the ground that Someone so unheroic as William Farr yeah. was nevertheless willing to go to jail. Uh -huh. let, let, well, let, uh, let, sorry, go ahead. Of course, uh, Mr. Rembar, I, th I think uh, your point really makes the discussion uh, academic because if newspaper men are so reliable that they aren't going to divulge their sources, uh, what, what is the necessity for a shield law? The, the newspaper men are shielding their sources, therefore they don't need to... A uh, shield law is unnecessary. I, I was merely responding to your observation about what's gone on since June 72. Oh, oh, oh. But I'd like to ask you, Mr. Williams, when, when you were an assistant district attorney, did the question of uh, a newspaperman's confidential information, or what he said was confidential, confidential information, ever come up? I don't think it did. In those days, the newspaper men, uh, at least in my own experience, were quite cooperative. Uh, in fact, uh, as you undoubtedly know, this question of uh, no newspaper man, man claimed uh, this uh, privilege until the year 1950, in the federal courts, until the year 1957. And no newspaper man claimed it in the state courts until 1897. In fact, uh, the first time that a newspaper man blocked an investigation, so far as I'm aware, was in 1857. And then he blocked it on the ground that there wasn't any law which required him to divulge the testimony. He said to, he, this was a, a re newspaper man who, uh, on the basis of whose of sources, the New York Times had published a story, and he was <coughs> investigated by the a committee of the House of Representatives in 1857. And he said, gentlemen, you haven't passed any law which requires me uh, to divulge it. Pass such a law, and I will be happy to do so. But in the absence of such a law, I can't betray my source. Who won? Uh, he went to jail, but after a few days in jail, he changed his mind and uh, testified. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he was held in contempt right, right he there. He was held then. in contempt by the House. Uh -huh. That, incidentally, was the episode which led to the enactment of the law, making it criminal to refuse to answer questions of an investigating committee. Oh, I see, I see. I, well, let, 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 let me ask you both uh, to reason for, for our, our a posteriori here, from, 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 from hypothetical situations on over to what it is that we desire. If, if we accept that the absolutization of this law uh, collides with the absolutization of uh, other laws, for instance, the Sixth Amendment, permitting you to subpoena uh, a witness in your behalf, then we recognize it's really a matter of social policy and that what we, what we really want to indulge more or less is emphases. Now, suppose a reporter who has a very good contact, let's say, uh, among um, the lesser mafiosi, Mafiosi? Mafioso. Maf Mafiosi. Mafioso? Uh, suppose, uh, suppose he finds out, let's say, that uh, 
a shipment of, of marijuana uh, is arriving at a particular drugstore the next day uh, 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 at noon. Uh, probably most people, and he tells this confidentially with the newsman, uh, apropos sort of a running story he's telling him about the drug trade. Now, I guess most people would agree that um, that, that uh, newspaper man uh, is not required to run to the grand jury, let alone is he required if somebody thinks that he might know to give testimony divulging it. However, let's, let's move along the scale of gravity and say that the identical person uh, hears not only about um, uh, an impending arrival of, of some marijuana, but hears about an impending plot to assassinate um, of the mayor of New York. And let's assume that he hasn't got a patriotic motive. Uh, now, where along the line from there to there, or, or uh, probably a neater way to say it is, would we all agree that he has some sort of an obligation to uh, use his confidential information in order to protect the mayor's life? Uh, of course. You would? Yes. Now, th would anybody that you know of disagree with you? Would anybody put uh, the confidential, uh, the, 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 the fact this was told to him confidentially, uh, in above, uh, above um, the, the citizen's duty to go and protect the mayor? In all the uh, proposals for legislation I've seen, yeah. uh, an imminent and serious crime uh, is stated as but an But not exception. a non-serious crime. Right. How about a lawyer? By, would, would a lawyer uh, have, to, have to sing if his client told me that he planned the assassination of somebody? Because I don't think so. I think a lawyer's uh, privilege is absolute. I suppose a lawyer, a, a responsible citizen, would feel impelled to... <laughs> it's distinguished to, from a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> distinguished from some lawyers. Uh, would feel impelled to go to the authorities and, and uh, reveal the, the, attempt, the, the, the plot to assassinate. But I don't know that he could be compelled to do so. A, a lawyer could not be compelled. Not in my opinion, no. Well, now, uh, the, uh, the, the, the newspaper man, happening upon such, uh, such information, in your opinion, uh, is required uh, to, uh, to divulge that information and would not be immunized or ought not to be immunized, which, if he should be called up between now and the plot program day for the assassination? I, I uh, disagree with Mr. Williams about the lawyer. Uh, I think that in the same circumstances I described, an imminent and serious crime, uh, the lawyer, the lawyer uh, client privilege does not operate. Uh, it, it would with a priest, I think, wouldn't it? Well, I, I confess that I've never had the question in my own practice, but I, <laughs> my reading of the cases on the subject is that the privilege is absolute. That is to say, the privilege of the, uh, of the, of the client. Of course, the client can waive the privilege. It's really the client's privilege rather than the lawyer's privilege. Oh, it is? Privilege. It's, oh, yes. the client's, it's obviously, yeah, but it's not the lawyer's. Uh, yes, yeah. but the lawyer, the lawyer is under the duty not to reveal what the client told him unless the client specifically releases him. Well, do, do we then reason from your positions on this that um, the congressional task is to distinguish at what point the seriousness of the crime overweighs the presumption in favor of a free flow of information that is secured by the protection of the source. I think I'd like to go back to that example for a moment. Suppose the client, the, the, the crime that the client uh, plans is the murder of the lawyer the next day, his bill having been too high. Yes. Uh, thank God they haven't thought of that <laughs> yet. Well, you could resign, I suppose. <laughs> As of five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have an undated letter of resignation. <laughs> well, the, uh, uh, is, this really, is, is this really what we're talking about? Uh, I, uh, in the Supreme Court cases of last June, one involved uh, drug culture, right? Right. And one involved what in last Riots. June? Riots. And the other was a Black Panther Black penetration. Panther. Infiltration or, or at least uh, yeah, yeah. developing a confidence with the Black Panther group. Well, is, is it legally feasible to uh, uh, attach the immunity to the protection of certain classes of offense, but not other classes? Yes, the laws of Illinois do that, for instance. They, the oh. laws of Illinois exclude libel and slander, and I, I think that is... I mean, the, the protection does or does not attach? Does not attach. Does not attach. In other words, 
Uh, Could you give us a hypothetical situation in which that would work? Well, let us say a magazine publishes a defamatory uh, article about a particular person. Uh, about a particular fellow traveler? <laughs> relying <laughs> relying, on, a, relying on, a, on a source, uh, undisclosed source. Uh, now, it is essential under the New York Times against Sullivan decision that the, that the person who has been defamed uh, show that the magazine did not have a sound basis, uh, that they acted recklessly. Uh, take the famous case of British publishing company against Butts, where the, uh, where the Saturday Evening Post relied on a very thin story by an ex-convict. To do what? To, to defame, to libel, to slander this uh, football coach. And the football coach brought an uh, uh, action in libel, and in the discovery proceedings before the trial, uh, brought, found, discovered from the Saturday Evening Post what its source was. Did the, did the Saturday Evening Post attempt to, uh, to, to uh, conceal its source? No, it did not. Uh, uh, that was before this discussion of shield laws really had arisen. Another famous case is Goldwater against Ginsburg. I might say we all seem to be assuming, uh, there, seem, uh, there seems to be a, a general disposition to assume that the source is always going to give correct information and that everybody is going to act bona fide. Now, in the cases of Curtis Publishing Company against Butts and Goldwater against Ginsburg, in one, the source was inherently unreliable and told really a fantastic story, but the Saturday Evening Post went ahead and on that basis published the defamatory article. Uh, in the other case, the publisher had these sources but really misquoted what his sources told him. Now, in neither case would the plaintiff have been able to recover for the defamation which he suffered unless he had been able to, in examination before trial, to ascertain what the source was and what the information was which the source had provided. Now, now in what sense is Illinois unique? Is it the only state? That there are 19 states that have shield laws of some kind. Is Illinois the only one that says that uh, in libel actions uh, a, a, a defendant has to produce his sources? Well, it's the only one I happen to know of. I happen to know of it because I have a, a case of my own in which it became incumbent upon me to read a discussion of the New York and Illinois statutes on this subject. And I observed that the Illinois statute expressly accepted libel and slander actions from its coverage. The New York statute does not. Well, in the balance of the states, those that have no shield laws at all, they, it, there would be no question about it, i.e. No, the defendant no. would have to come up with its sources. That's right. Do you think they should? In, in which situation? Uh, in a libel case. Well, there was a... Uh, incidentally, you know, you, uh, you said at the beginning I'd written an article on uh, this subject. I, I had not. I had written an article which, in passing, said this was a very tough problem. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a case... Uh, involving the mayor of St. Louis in the Sixth Cervantes, Circuit, yeah. uh, in which he raised uh, this very issue. He said that in order to show, as I must now under the libel law, that uh, the uh, reporter was lying or acting recklessly, uh, I have to know what his sources were. <clears throat> and the court uh, I think took a rather good view. Uh, they said uh, that might very well be the case uh, in other situations. Here, however, the mayor has shown so little uh, that goes against uh, everything the defendant has shown that we're not going to permit it. But we might in other cases. Uh huh. Uh huh. <coughs> So they, they were not ruling it out categorically. Not at all. But merely on the grounds that it was sort of a fishing expedition. That in, in this particular case, the mayor had, had so little to go yeah. on. I take it that was post Vidal versus Buckley. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> it wasn't it Buckley versus Vidal. <laughs> <laughs> Is the plaintiff always first? Usually. I see. In, in the old days, when you went up on appeal, maybe still, I'm, I'm not sure, the appellant got to be first in the upper court. Uh, even though he might have been the defendant below. Well, wh wh what, what do we, um, uh, are, are we in the direction of concluding that the court's adjudication of the various rights uh, is, is, is more reliable than, any, than anything Congress could come up with? Uh, is, is that your opinion, Mr. Williams? Yes, of course. In the cases decided by the Supreme Court in June 1972, 
the majority opinion did not say that any assistant district attorney can call any newspaper man before the court at any time and ask him any questions that he wants to, the court was very careful to say, and this was emphasized by Justice Powell in his concurring opinion, uh, that the court should protect the newspaper man, man from harassment. Uh, really, the difference between the majority and the minority was a question of burden of proof. Who has to go ahead? Uh, the majority took the view that the uh, newspaper man should show some reason to think that the, the situation was harassment, whereas the minority took the view that the, it was up to the prosecution to show how absolutely necessary it was that it get this uh, newspaper man's testimony, which, of course, is extremely, uh, as a former assistant <laughs> United States attorney, I will say is, uh, I think, often extremely difficult to do. Le le lead, well, if you were, if you were, um, uh, if you were a Senator Irvin in the existing situation, would you therefore recommend the passage of no legislation? I th well, when you say no legislation, uh, are you talking exclusively about grand jury investigations, or are you talking about the whole gamut, civil trials? After all, the defendant has certain, the criminal defendant, as you mentioned, the Sixth Amendment uh, gives a criminal defendant in the federal courts uh, the right to compulsory process on his mm -hmm. behalf. Now, uh, it might be desirable, and in, in these Watergate cases, I can see that the prospective defendants, when as and if these indictments are turned down, uh, would want to call on uh, the uh, news compulsory process against the newspaper newspapers to uh, find out what their sources were. That seems to me a very probable strategy on behalf of the defense counsel uh, when the indictments are returned down. So we're talking about a variety <coughs> of cases. Uh, I, as far as civil trials are concerned, uh, the recent decision of the Federal Court of Appeals here in a civil case I think deals with the situation very adequately. It says it's up to the discretion of the court. The court can compel the newspaper man to testify, but if in an appropriate circumstance, he can, it can relieve the newspaper man. And in the particular case then before the court, uh, because the court decided that the plaintiff in that action could find the information from other sources without any great difficulty, uh, the subpoena against the newspaper man, against the journalist, was vacated. Uh, I don't think Congress can touch the defendant in the criminal trial by virtue of the Sixth Amendment. Uh, I think we're really talking about grand jury investigations, and there it would seem to me uh, that the majority opinion gives a court sufficient latitude to protect newspaper men. <coughs> I, I think so far as the uh, Watergate defendants are concerned, when uh, defendant's counsel uh, goes to find out what the newspaper man's source was, he'll find that it was defendant's counsel. No, I think it's more probable that he'll find out that it was the prosecution. Uh, I mean, when we get uh, daily reports as to uh, what the grand jury, uh, as to the testimony yesterday before the grand jury, I don't know where that came from unless it came from the prosecution. I may be entirely mistaken. I just... Uh, well, uh, copies go out to all the senators, don't they? <clears throat> Uh, you're talking about the investigating committee. Oh, I'm, talking about, I'm, I'm sorry, talking about yeah, the grand yeah. jury. Uh, well, it might be a ju an individual juror. It might be it? an individual juror. But, uh, Are they ever punished for things like that or not? Yes, yes. A violation of uh, Rule 6E of the Rules of Criminal Procedure. Will we have a special prosecutor to... Public, to, uh... <laughs> <laughs> to prosecute the special prosecutor? <laughs> 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 no, but I think that the... And actually, uh, it's only fair to say the special pr prosecutor, Cox, seems to have stopped these leaks. At any rate, there hasn't been so much leaking from the, from the prosecution team as distinguished from the Senate Investigating Committee mm -hmm. team. I, I, I don't want to imply that I know that the leaks did come from the uh, prosecuting It's just uh, a deduction. It's just a deduction. Yeah. I don't know. It, it, it seems to be the, uh, they seem to be the obvious source. Yeah. But at any rate, I'm sure the defense counsel uh, will want to establish mm -hmm. uh, that the <clears> leaks did come from the prosecution team because that would enable them to take advantage of the doctrine of the Supreme Court, that they, which takes a very dim view of the fair trial situation when the prosecution has been leaking to the newspapers. If, uh, if the Washington Post bugged the grand jury room, what would be the nature of its offense? Illegal bugging, or would, it, or, or would that be transcended by its press privileges to reveal uh, all possible information even as it viewed its responsibility to publish the Pentagon Papers as transcending whatever 
laws there were that forbade people from releasing classified documents. Yeah. Well, under the Brandberg decision, they could be prosecuted for all sorts of things. Uh, <clears throat> misuse of uh, electronic equipment, contempt of court. And, uh, but, but, but th that decision being as highly criticized as it is, if it had gone the other way, would there be no effective remedy against the bugging of uh, grand jury proceedings? Oh, no, I think, uh, it, as Mr. Williams says, it must violate several laws. Uh, they so wouldn't be so hard to find. So could find a few. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's turn, <clears throat> let's turn to, our, to our panel. Mr. Joel Persky is lecturer of speech and, and theater at Herbert Lehman College. Mr. Persky? Well, Mr. Williams, perhaps this is an oversimplification, but if, if we are guaranteed the right to speak uh, with certain restrictions, clear and present danger and things like that, perhaps as a corollary to that, we have the right to remain silent, especially if a situation arises where it hasn't been determined if a, a crime has been committed, vis-a-vis -vis Samuel Popkin in the Ellsberg case, where he becomes privy to certain information and um, he's unwilling to state where the information comes from and he is sent to jail. Now, does he not have the, remain, the right to remain silent in that type of situation as a corollary to the First you, you, Amendment? You better describe the Popkin case. For the, 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 which the, case? The Popkin case, the Harvard. Uh, oh, the Harvard professor. Uh, I'm <clears> not sufficiently familiar with the facts of that case to speak about it with confidence, but it, as, as I recall the facts, especially as they were written up by uh, National Review and by Mr. Buckley in his syndicated column, uh, the facts indicated that it was harassment of the witness in that case, and therefore in line with the majority opinion of the Supreme Court in the Brandsburg case, the, the district court very properly uh, let him go, or rather the prosecution realized that it could not continue. Uh, I think it was the initiative of the prosecution by uh, uh, reason of which he was released, and I, I think that they realized they were could not hold him because they were opening themselves up to a charge of harassment. Well, well the grand jury was dissolved, wasn't it? I think so. Is that how Popkin was sprung? I'm not really yes, sure. Yes, yeah, yeah, it comes back to me now. You're correct, Mr. Buckley. What happened was uh, that the grand, the, uh, on the motion of the district attorney, the grand jury was dissolved, and a witness who is in contempt of court by reason of refusal to answer a question before a grand jury cannot be held after the dissolution of the grand jury unless he has previously been given a fixed term sentence, which Professor Popkin had not been given. The, uh, actually, in that case, the Boston federal courts held against Popkin, uh, and that was after the Caldwell and Brandsburg uh, decisions. They held it that he had to answer? That he had to answer, <coughs> and I, I felt uh, that their decision was wrong even under uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court uh, majority holding. Uh, because Popkin uh, behaved uh, punctiliously. He didn't refuse to appear. He appeared. He answered a number of questions. He refused to answer just a few, as to which he gave very good reasons. And those few questions, uh, it seemed to me, were not important to the prosecution. So that even in the present state of the law, as announced by the Supreme Court, which I think is bad, uh, I think Popkin should not have uh, been convicted. Uh, of course, apart from the question of harassment, I don't know that I would agree with your analysis <coughs> uh, of the Popkin case. Uh, Professor Popkin was not a journalist. He was not a newsman. He was a scholar writing, uh, as I understand, planning to write a definitive treatise on the subject. Now, we say that there's the tradition of the, that the, the minority of the Supreme Court case emphasized the tradition of the confidential <coughs> source for journalists. Now, as far as scholarship is concerned, there's no there's no tradition of confidential source. In fact, scholarship is shown by listing your sources. By lots of footnotes. Lots of footnotes. That That's indicates that you're a scholar. I think it, it makes a difference whether you're uh, um, an antiquarian or a sociologist dealing with current problems. Uh, if you are dealing with current problems, it may be that you can get only, you can get your information only by promising to preserve confidences. Of, of course, there we come up against the situation illustrated by uh, Mr. Halberstam's book, The Best and the Brightest. Now, there, Mr. Professor Rostow, Professor Walt Rostow, uh, has said that every single remark attributed to him in that book is false. Now, I don't question Mr. Uh, Halberstam's good faith, but we all know that when information is transmitted from A to B to C to D and so on, it, uh, it gets more colorful. 
<laughs> it gets more colorful. It also gets garbled. And I, I wonder whether we're uh, whether that is scholarship when when one relies on on uh, such indirect sources. But I, I trust we've answered your question as best we can, <laughs> Mr. First King. Uh, sure, Mr. Mr. Stephen Schlesinger, lecturer in, in the case of history. Of Halberstrom, though, most of what he did was accumulated in the process of writing newspaper and magazine articles. Would he then have been protected under what you say from the charges by Rastow and or whatever else? Well, and, and also, uh, can't a book be considered a piece of journalism? Yeah, I would, I would think in this case it well, would Well, you know, be. Uh, you started, Mr. Buckley, by asking what is a yeah. newsman. I don't think the privilege uh, should be confined to newsmen. I think uh, authors of books uh, should come within it. And other people whose general function is to put information <coughs> before the public. I think that's the test, really. It's a, it's a First Amendment Type problem. Seven. Well, uh, what is confidential about what they do? Well, suppose, suppose the secret source delivers the copy to the typesetter. <coughs> who, the, who reads it? Yeah, who gets it from him and proceeds to, <laughs> proceeds to uh, reproduce it. Well, he's been put under no uh, obligation of secrecy, has he? You know, suppose, we're dealing so with... Suppose, suppose the managing editor who has been dealing with the guy said, don't, don't notice who the guy is who's going to give you the last minute copy. Mm -hmm. well, I know this is reduced ad absurdum, but, but this, is, this is a legitimate uh, epistemological device, isn't it? But what I'm saying is that we should, the focus you is you not... Start, you start off by being very narrow in defining a newsman. All of a sudden, you become encyclopedic. No, what I'm saying is that the newsman is not the only person to whom the privilege should extend. That we have to consider this in the light of the policy, the policy of the First Amendment, which is to put information before the public. And so your definition becomes a functional one. Mm -hmm. That is, in the light of the function of so the First Amendment. So you would include the under certain circumstances? Yes. You know, uh, <clears throat> of course, the, what the First Amendment says is that Congress shall pass no law abridging the freedom of speech or the press. Uh, now, that talks about speech, and news gathering is not speech. And well, I suppose it was for that reason that it wasn't until 1957, which was uh, 170 approximate years after the adoption of the First Amendment, uh, that uh, <coughs> anyone ever suggested uh, this a, sh uh, a newsman's privilege under the First Amendment. In fact, the first Congress, which adopted the First Amendment, also adopted uh, a statute making misprison of felony criminal, misprison of felony being the failure of anyone to reveal to the prosecuting authorities information he which he may have regarding the commission of a crime. So apparently the First Amendment, uh, excuse me, the first Congress uh, did not think there was anything inconsistent between the First Amendment and the requirement that anyone knowing about the commission of a crime be compelled to reveal it. Well, that very same first Congress provided capital punishment for forgery. Uh, I don't think we can uh, decide too much about what the Constitution means now by looking at what that first Congress did. I mean, I, I think you would say that that uh, would be a cruel and unusual punishment under the Eighth Amendment. No, he's talking about principles. He's not talking about the specification of, uh, of an appropriate punishment. No, but all I'm saying is that their view of, of what <clears throat> the Bill of Rights meant, the view of that Congress, should not necessarily uh, constrict our view of what it means. Well, of course, you're ad adopting the view that the First Amendment uh, means nowadays whatever we want it to mean, whereas customarily in statutory construction or constitutional construction, uh, one endeavors to find out what the people enacted, who enacted the statute or the constitutional provision meant. That's part of it. Uh, Ms. Stegmeyer, Ms. Norma Stegmeyer, Assistant Professor of Speech and Theater at yes. Herbert Lee. I'd like to ask both gentlemen individually, based on your comments, shedding light on the complexity of this problem and the different aspects, what do you see as a law that Congress will come up with, assuming that they do it in this present Congress, that would be a shield law acceptable and taking care of the many aspects of the problem that you pointed out? Mr. Williams? Do you venture again? Well, I, I would say that Congress uh, uh, enacts laws more on the basis of what is fashionable, what the what enlightened people think at any given moment, than on what really the situation may properly require by uh, on the authority of uh, uh, scholars in their tents. And at the present moment, I would say, it seems to me at any rate, that the media are rather riding high because the media have exposed uh, Watergate 
and therefore they have shown that there's something very fine and, and wonderful about them, and I think the media are likely to get what they want. Uh, therefore, I would say that uh, Congress will enact some kind of shield law. Thank you. Do, do you agree, Mr. Ambar? Uh, well, maybe a more interesting question to ask you is, do you think Nixon would, would veto <coughs> Uh, a shield law, such a shield law as would accomplish most of the purposes you seek to uh, uh, achieve? One as broad as I would like, I would say <coughs> yes. Uh, I think he would accept uh, something that didn't go quite that far, and I regard his decision as being entirely a political one. If you, uh, if you reveal the minutes of a grand jury proceeding, is that a misdemeanor or a felony? It's a contempt of court. And what's that? Well, that Properly speaking, it's a misdemeanor. Well, uh, would, it, would it be uh, re reaching simply for an easy distinction? Uh, would it be wise to say that uh, misdemeanors uh, one cannot be compelled to testify about, but not so felonies? Would that satisfy you? Along this no, business it, of it trying to, try to find the line by, at which you distinguish between gravity and trivial expenses, uh, offenses. Well, uh, let's take a, a very high crime, uh, corruption in, in high places. Is that very high? I think so. <laughs> uh, uh, to my mind, it's, it's the basic crime, uh, much more damaging to society than uh, things like murder, arson, mayhem. Not as high as intellectual corruption, surely. Uh, but go ahead. That, that one's hard to pin down. Mm -hmm. uh, I think th there you have uh, you know, a good example of what's difficult in, in a statute like this. Let's say the crime charged is that uh, corruption in the highest places, and the reporter is one whose career depends upon being welcome in high places. Uh, there, uh, I think it may be, that may be one of those situations of overriding, compelling public need. So that rather than make the <coughs> distinction uh, the way you've made it, Mr. Mm -hmm. Buckley, it might be necessary to make it the other way. The more important the crime, uh, the more important the need for disclosure. Well, this, this, this doesn't give you much relief if you're trying to, uh, to preempt, uh, to abort the commission of a crime, does it? To go back to our assassination example, that God knows that's an extremely grave uh, crime, but, but crime, but it's one in contemplation. Yes. You wouldn't apply the, the Rambos standard to that, would you? No, I was just saying that uh, the situation I described would be one of the exceptions to the shield, and so would the one you've just now described. Well, all right, we, we got a situation where every day we read in the newspaper stuff that is, quotes, uh, illegally secured. Now, give, given the Supreme Court's position, why can't you, why can't a grand jury call up the guy who wrote the story and say, where did you get this information about a grand jury? Uh, about a secret proceeding. Why, why don't they, in fact, do that? I'm mystified. I don't know why the, why the district court of the District of Columbia hasn't done something about it. Uh, I, I, I can't, I have no idea. Have you any idea? I, I don't know. Where, uh, where the reporter acts uh, in uh, derogation of a judicial order, you may have another exception. That was uh, the Farr case, mm -hmm. uh, where, as you know, uh, to protect the defendant, the judge ordered the lawyers not to talk about a certain statement that had been given. Uh, Farr obtained that statement, he said, from one of the lawyers. The judge called all the lawyers in and said, which one of you, and every one of them denied it. Now, uh, I think there's a situation where, uh, to which the privilege should not extend. Uh, you cannot disrupt the processes of the court when the court is trying to afford a defendant a fair trial. So you think Farr should have gone to jail? Um, when you have to consider other things in that case, and that is the nature of what he was disclosing, which was of no importance whatever, and uh, merely uh, the kind of sensational news that... Well, isn't, isn't it almost impossible for Congress in a law to conceptualize the subtlety of, of what, what you said here in the last uh, few minutes, really? Of course. That's... Uh, that's something that has to be done by the courts on a case-to-case -case basis in interpreting the statute. Mr. Schlesinger? I, I've um, 
does it matter, as is to both gentlemen, if the source reveals the information to more than one reporter? Um, in the Farr case, I don't know whether he was the only reporter privy to information. He's the only one who published it. Could, could, one, could one reporter be sent to jail for information which came to many reporters? Do you have and, in other words, came out I, I, what I think would be the public realm. He'd be sent to jail for refusing to, to uh, reveal disclose the source. In other words, who, who told him and yeah. everybody else? Yeah, I'm just wondering, you know, in, in those cases, if if protection would apply. I, I don't think that that should make a difference. It, what, it, what about if there was in, uh, there was apparent victimization, right? Yes. That they're, they're going after him, even though the information is available. That's what I, that sources. would be. One person would be subpoenaed. I assume. Well, as I say, I, I don't. I think the, the privilege should be available to him. It doesn't make the privilege less available that other people have been told. Well, as I understand, the argument is that this should be for the protection of confidential sources. Now, the claim of confidentiality, it seems to me, becomes rather implausible if the source has leaked the information to a large That's number of I people. Mean, uh, yeah. I, I don't see how it can be persuasively argued that the source is that confidential. Is, uh, that, uh, the implication was had to do with Watergate with that. I, I think yes. that that would probably, uh, as I see it, apply in this situation. Well, you, you don't, uh, you have to assume the answer to the question before you know whether the source told all these people or whether the rest of them got it somewhere else. Well, uh, of course, uh, we're discussing a rather academic situation. We don't know what kind of a shield law is going to be passed. I don't think that under the Brandsburg decision, any reporter could argue very persuasively uh, that he's being harassed when it develops that if he gave the information to anybody, he gave it to a large number of people. In the, other words, if the burden of proof is on him to show harassment, I don't think he could show it under the hypo hypothetical situation which you refer to. Mr. Persky? Uh, there's a certain confusion in my mind. If in the Caldwell case, the Supreme Court has said, you must make your sources known, how can the Congress talk about passing a law that would be in contradiction to the, uh, the Supreme Court finding? The, the, uh, the Supreme Court said the First Amendment standing alone does not protect you reporters. But Congress can then come along and say, well, even though the Constitution doesn't protect you, Here we can refinement. pass a law. In fact, the Supreme Court expressly said that. It said, we don't see that the Constitution protects reporters here, but if Congress wants to protect them, let it do so. Ms. Tegmaier? Are reporters facing more and more harassment lately, or this is, again, something for this decade, and 10 years from now, it would not be under discussion? Well, I, I can't see that they are. In fact, it seems to me that there, I, I read more and more stories in the paper which are attributed to confidential sources, sources who prefer to remain anonymous and so forth than, than I ever have in the past. That's just an impression. I haven't researched the subject. You know, if, if, uh, if you're speaking of an absolute quantum of harassment, I would say there probably is more. But if you're speaking of uh, a proportion, I think perhaps there's less. That is, we have much bigger government, much bigger press, a much more complicated society, a lot more to write about. Much more crime. Yes. Right. I agree. Uh, Mr. Schlesinger? Yeah, I, I would ask you, Mr. Buckley, as a, as a journalist, if, on the same lines, if you find that it is more difficult um, since these decisions to get information or the people um, that you know as journalists um, are overly concerned with this, do you think that there is a uh, obsession on the part of, of the press, and in some cases, drumbeating for the passage of um, absolute shield. Yes, Mr. Mr. Buckley, since the Supreme Court decision, have your confidential sources clammed up? Don't answer. <laughs> <laughs> Who are they? <laughs> <laughs> Without naming them, tell us what their, their strategy has been. <laughs> well, I, I simply haven't been put to the test. I, I, I do think that, um, uh, I do think that some some reporters tend to um, tend to forget that it is it is intended in the in the social uh, idea that uh, sometimes one has to, one has to uh, pay the consequences uh, of a certain uh, privilege. I, I don't mean that uh, that I'm in favor of all reporters automatically going to jail when they refuse to reveal the confidential source, but but uh, I do think that. Uh, uh, a certain inconvenience uh, is, 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 is a part of the process of, of martyrdom. People want sort of 
button-down, air-conditioned martyrdom these days, and, uh, and when, they, when they actually have to suffer a little bit for the exercise of their prerogatives, they tend to resent it. And this, I think, is a distinction that is uh, uh, occasionally uh, lost as, as we emphasize, as we so widely do, the privileges of the press. I, I In the case of Mr. Farr, you, 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 you both honor Mr. Farr and disagree with him, right? No, uh, what I said was that his going to jail had an effect. Uh, what you uh, no, described you him as heroic, I rejected the description. Uh, the Farr case, incidentally, is quite different because it is the giving of the information itself that was the forbidden act. That is, it wasn't information about something mm -hmm, mm -hmm. else. What A did to B was forbidden rather than what B refused to do to A. Yes. The mere communication was forbidden. Yes. That, that, that would have as a, a, an analog the grand jury situation, right? Giving out the minutes of the grand jury to the Washington Post yes. is yes. the forbidden yes. act, yes. not the printing of them. Mm -hmm. Right. But you track back to who A was via B. I might say forbidden as I understand the law. There hasn't been any prosecution, so perhaps I don't understand the law. But if, if I'm capable of The law was never written that you don't understand. <laughs> 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 Well, then, uh, uh, in, in summary, you, uh, you doubt that uh, specific legislation is going to substantially clarify the problem. Is that right, Mr. Rambo? I don't know any legislation that has that effect. That is, all legislation gives rise to uh, judicial problems. Yeah. And uh, this suggested. perhaps more than, than most. Uh, the legislation could help, I think. I would like to see it. Uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, the kind of thing we're discussing now will be solved. Thank you very much, Mr. Rambo and Mr. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen of the panel, ladies and gentlemen. For a printed bound copy of this program, send 25 cents in coin to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29250. That's 25 cents to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29250. This program was made possible by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. This is a presentation of the Southern Educational Communications Association.